In this video, I'm going to show you how I've got a radio control handset to interface with the Raspberry Pi Pico. This will cover the steps to communicate between the remote and the Pico, which I'll demonstrate working at the end of the video. But this is only in terms of getting the communication working between the controller and the Pico. In future, I'll be using this to control a robot. So if you're interested in that, then please subscribe to this channel and click on the bell icon to get notified when the next video is available. In the video, I'll explain about the RC controller that I'm using. I'll explain how radio control controllers work from the point of view of how they interface with other components, which are normally servo motors. Then I'll show how I did some experiments using the remote control receiving connected to a digital logical analyzer and an oscilloscope, so I could see the output from the receiver. I then connected the outputs of the receiver to a Raspberry Pi Pico, and I'll show the code needed to read the values. I'll then explain how this can be used to control various different electronic outputs, such as controlling a robot, or it could be used for animatronics or controlling other devices. First, a little about the controller. This is an existing RC controller that I already had. I'd like to use it now with the Raspberry Pi Pico. This particular model is intended for model airplanes, but it can be used for other things as well. It's called the Flysky FS i6. You should be able to use many other different controllers and they don't need to be designed for planes. If you get a transmitter-receiver combination for other devices, then they should work in the same way. It comes as a transmitter and receiver. The transmitter is a handheld controller, and then the receiver is normally installed in the plane. I won't go into details about how the transmitter and receiver communicate, but here's a quick summary. It sends a signal using the 2.4 GHz frequency, which is one of the frequencies designated for unlicensed devices. This means you don't need a license to use them. Most countries will allow the use of that frequency, and it's also commonly used for Wi-Fi and other wireless equipment, such as cordless phones. It uses GFSK for sending the signals, which is a type of frequency shift keying. You don't really need to know much else unless you're wanting to create a different receiver as it's the receiver that will need to interface to the Pico. The receiver has six channels, each of which is able to control a servo motor. Servos are motors that can be controlled precisely using PWM. On a remote control plane, these could control servos which would move the rudders and elevators, or other channels could be used to control continuous rotation motors through a speed controller, or could even move a mechanical throttle on a petrol engine. The important thing to know is that servos normally use pulse width modulation. So if we can read that with the Pico, then we can determine the position of the levers of the transmitter. And this is done using pulse width modulation or PWM. I've covered pulse width modulation on an earlier video on controlling the speed of a DC motor. But whilst that is still PWM, this works a little different that we need our microcontroller to accurately measure the size of the pulse rather than having the output control the motor directly. This animation shows an example trace for a theoretical PWM pulse. You'll see that the pulse is the same width for each of the two lines and the duty cycle is the length of time that the pulse is on versus the time the pulse is off. The top and bottom lines are both showing the same width pulse. But if I change the duty cycle for the bottom line, you'll see that the on time increases and the off time decreases. This is how different values are sent and how we can determine the position of the levers. This is the theory, but I wanted to actually test this before wiring up the Pico. So my next step is connect the receiver to a digital signal analyzer and then an oscilloscope so I can check the actual value of the signals. I'm going to use my Bitscope to look at the waveforms in detail. I'm particularly concerned that the receiver runs at 5 volts, so I need to make sure that the signals can be safely connected to the Pico without risk of damage. So I've taken the remote control receiver and I've connected this to my logic analyzer. It's a, a Bitscope with logic analyzer and oscilloscope. The channels we're interested in here are the six channels. They're, they're numbered from zero on the logic analyzer, but they're labeled one to six on the 
receiver so I'll use those references so channel 1 up to channel 6 on here and as you can see they're all showing zero voltage at the moment they're all showing a low so if I turn it on so there was a, a few little spikes there but I haven't actually turned the remote control on yet so that was just powering up the receiver so I've now powered on the controller and as you can see these have all got uh, sort of a square wave a very narrow square wave this is pulse width modulation and all six are pretty much in sync and they're more or less the same values I'm going to start by moving some of the controls and we can see what happens so I'm going to start with the left hand sorry the right hand controller um, as I hold it in my hand and if I push that down you'll see the brown one channel 2 is uh, it's got narrower and if I push it up it gets wider so that's channel 2 and the same control knob but move it from side to side would be channel 1 so if I move it to the left that's shaking channel 1 the white one and that's narrower and move it to the right that's got wider so the reason for these being this form of pulse width modulation is because that's what servo motors use so this signal could be sent straight to a servo motor um, but obviously we're wanting to interpret this ourselves just carry on going through the controls so if I take the left hand side of the controller and push that up that's the red line so that's number three it's getting wider and pull it down and it gets narrower push it to the left and then channel four the orange or gold color gets narrower and push it to the right and it gets wider now the other two are the auxiliary channels the yellow and green and they're controlled by two knobs on the top of the controller so if i turn them anti-clockwise down as though it's zero lowest value that's the yellow one has got smaller thinner and turn it up and those got wider and likewise for the the top one there's its smallest setting and there's its highest so there's two additional controls on there that can be used there are a selection of switches as well across the controller but those don't actually do anything in here what these are is this programmable feature of the remote control and these can be used to set say minimum thresholds of the various other controls for instance if you were using a petrol driven remote control airplane obviously this is an airplane or helicopter controller and you wanted to make sure that the engines the petrol driven engines continue to turn then you can use these to set say a minimum throttle amount so that the, they keep turning and you can just set those and use those switches accordingly but they're not set to do anything on this one and there's a few other little controls for trimming and then you've got the programmable interface um, so that's it looking at the logic analyzer and obviously it's just taking these as highs and lows I'm going to just take two of these channels and I'm going to put them on the digital oscilloscope so we can see those as well and I'll explain a bit more about that in a short while I've now moved to the digital oscilloscope so that we can see just one of the waveforms I've got channel A and channel B both connected but if I turn them on you'll see that the signals are, are pretty much the same I've just turned that one back off I've just set this channel A so that it's referenced at zero so this is zero volts here and we can see as we 
change the width of the signal using the channel A cursor which is the one on the right. The real reason for putting this is so that I can have a look at the voltage that we've got here. So if you see we've got one volt per division and each of these is a division so we've got one two three and then it's 0.6 volts 3.6 so I'm looking to put this onto a Pico which is designed for 3.3 volts probably should be okay but I think I might just put a small resistor uh, voltage divider in there or something just to make sure that we don't do it cause any damage to the Pico. Before I connect this to the Pico, I need to check whether the signal can be safely connected directly to the Pico GPIO pins, or whether I need to lower the signal voltage first. For example, I know that the Pico works at 3.3 volts, and that connecting a 5 volt supply to any of the Pico GPIO pins can permanently damage it. Turning to the data sheet for the RP2040, shows that the input voltage can be up to 0.3 volts above the input output reference voltage IO VDD. This allows up to 3.6 volts, so it's safe to connect the receiver signal directly to the Pico. I've connected the receiver to the Raspberry Pi Pico. I connected the power supply to the 5 volt VBUS pin on the Pico and to the supply ground. I've then connected the receiver to pins labelled GP3, GP5, GP7, GP9, GP11 and GP13. You'll notice that these are all the odd GPIO numbers. That's because the PWM is split into A and B pins. Only the B pins are able to act as inputs and these are the odd numbered pins. I've connected these in reverse order so receiver channel 1 connects to GP13 and channel 2 to GP11, etc. The reason for this is because I can connect them using jump leads and I don't have to twist the order of the wires. It just made it more convenient. I will then let the code perform the translation of the channel numbers to the appropriate GPIO numbers. I've also connected a serial connection between the Raspberry Pi and the Pico, although I'm using the USB connection for this testing. And I've connected to the debug pins as well, just to make it easy to upload the code without needing to disconnect the USB and hold down the power button each time I need to upload a new version. The next step is to use the Pico to measure the duty cycle for each of the six channels. There is some C code on the Raspberry Pi Pico GitHub Pico Examples repository. This is in the PWM folder called Measure Duty Cycle, which is what we need to do. The code worked well for a single PWM pin, but I found it to be a little less reliable when used across multiple pins. It sometimes works, but sometimes gives values that are outside the range, typically very small values. Not being able to work out the exact reason for this, but I have found a workaround, which is to measure the value twice and take the largest of the two numbers, and I found that to be much more reliable. There is still an occasional invalid reading across the two samples, but I just ignore those and it usually works next time. I've not been able to track down the reason for this. It may be possible to create an alternative method of measuring the duty cycle using the PIO feature of the Pico, but I've not had a chance to look into that yet. When the receiver is not receiving a signal from the transmitter, such as if the transmitter is switched off or is out of range, then it gives the value of zero. As you can see, when I connect using Minicom, it shows the values for each of the six channels. These are values between 10 and 20, with 15 being the midpoint. With this information, it should be possible to create a program that responds to the appropriate co codes. The thing I'm looking at doing with this is implementing an updated version of my Mechanum robot which will then be controlled by the radio control. I need to see if I can control four PWM outputs and direction control at the same time as sampling for all these inputs. I'll be working on that and have a look at creating a custom PCB for this project in future. 
So it might take a few weeks before this is finished. And if you're interested in any of these, please click subscribe to my channel and click on the notification bell to get notified when the videos are out. You could also use this for other purposes, for controlling just about any kind of electronics through the Raspberry Pi Pico. It would certainly be useful for animatronics where you could instruct the Pico to carry out certain actions based on the controller. I hope you found this video useful. If so, please give it a like and let me know in the comments if you create any projects using the remote control with a Pico or indeed any other kind of microcontroller. I hope to see you again on a future video.